artificial television, but you're required to own a television set. So the NES decoupled the television set from broadcast logics, which is significant for the politics of the industry, and it's different to what, to what cable did and what the VCR did. But then we fast forward to about 1994, and, um, uh, and Sony dumps its project to build the Nintendo CD, and instead, you know, invents the, uh, the PlayStation. And the PlayStation, I believe, is significant because for the first time we see the video game console positioned as an interactive media device. So it partly had to do with the storage functionality, it used CDs for storage. Now CDs for storage were used before the PlayStation, um, but what the PlayStation included was software to play music. Now I don't think that anybody necessarily played a whole lot of music on their PlayStation, although there are stories of guys hacking them later to increase the audio quality that you can get out of them. But ultimately, the PlayStation was an interactive media tool, it was not just a console. And we really saw this accelerated when we had the, uh, the launch of the Xbox and, and the, the PS2, which of course had DVD playback functionality. And that really was the killer app, I think for moving the console out of um, the domain of a kid's toy and in further into the domain of a leisure device. Because what we see now is the console um, progressively positioned at the center of the living room experience. Of course, the people who really did that were the wonderful hackers who decided that basically uh, an Xbox is just a PC. Uh, and so with a little bit of tinkering here and there and a, a solar point or two, what you can do is stream all of your DivX content to it and use it, you know, really unlock its functionality as you know, a kind of home media centre. Um, but what we see also, I think, however, is, is a changed relationship with technology um, themselves as it becomes something that becomes more integral to our living room experience. So this is from Hartley's, I'm just going to backtrack for a second to get you where I'm going. This is from, uh, a picture on the right is from, is from Hartley's study of television. It's a picture from the 1960s um, of a lass uh, who got married in front of the TV. <laughs> But this is not necessarily exceptional. People were doing this at the time. Um, partly because when you think about what people do with television sets, particularly before they became flat screen and we integrated into entertainment uh, systems, um, they were altars. You know, you put photos of the grandkids on and some pretty flowers. And so why not get married in front of the, of the TV? And it's just gone forward a slide instead of bringing up. Oh, I did. Uh, and then on the, on the right, of course, we have Carol Cini, um, who uh, had this, this game cake. Um, custom made for a wedding. That's her husband looking very disappointed in the background. <laughs> I have no facts to back that up. Um, but you know, she, she got this, this cake custom built, and I think that there's a parallel here in the, the role that video games play in our life as a, an ordinary domestic technology. What we have at the same time, however, of course, is a reinvigoration of this notion of science. So once the, when, when the, uh, the NES is the, is the kid's toy, the science of it doesn't really matter. It's one of the reasons that the Dreamcast is a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful um, platform is because the Dreamcast was freaking futuristic. You know, and it had the poor little LCD displays and controls and all this mad science, you know? And we, we're seeing this reinvigorated as people charge you more and more for consoles and tell you that they can do more and more things. But what it is really um, is uh, a reappropriation or, or, or the return of an old discourse about the introduction of new technologies. Because on the left, there's a picture from 1956 of the introduction of television to Australia. And what's maddest about that is the guy's wearing a lab coat. Um, <laughs> television, the most domestic of technologies, you know, was at one point freaking science. And so I return to this, to this picture. Because what I see in this picture is, is a kind of fusion of all of these things. First up, we have the video game console. Um, as now uh, both more than an ordinary object, but not quite something special. You know, to have it in your house is not exceptional. It's often, you know, it's often had in this kind of a cluttered lounge room environment, which invites a whole lot of dis uh, discussions about gender and about labour, about space organisation, particularly when we move down to this kind of a setup, where the console is only one amongst a whole bunch of other entertainment toys. I mean, this is an incredibly gendered experience to set up your console like this. Because this is about saying, the console, like the DVR and like the, this is the big pump and audio system and this is the, the, the DVD player, needs to be positioned amongst all of these tools that undomesticate a domestic space. And so what we see with the emergence of the console as a significant kind of tool for, you know, uh, multi-platform entertainment, is we see the rise of, um, the home theatre and the rise of the home theatre served to remasculinize the living room or the lounge room. It was no longer a 
a side of domestic play. Instead, it was a friggin' theatre, you know, that you had to have pump and sound for. And so one of the interesting things that's, that's come up now, of course, is the wireless controller, which resolves, apparently, one of the, um, of the, the key complaints that come with, uh, with uh, uh, mixed gendered living environments and video game consoles. And that's what the hell happens when you have to hide you know, the controllers because it looks, looks like a mess on the floor. So you'll notice that I'm kind of at the end of all of the things that I had to say, which was just a bit of a, a maelstrom really about the role that consoles play in the leisure space. What I'd really like to do is use this as an opportunity to make a plea. I'd actually like people to send me photos um, of their console setups uh, at home, complete with a little story about your console. And what I'd really like is if people are hanging out with their mum, maybe they could go and dig through old photos and see if they could find old photos that might feature the living room environment. Um, with the console. Because what I'd like to do if I could amass enough material is actually to put together a, a, a study that starts to look at the way that, that the console has been located within the domestic politics of the living room and the way that it's changing as the console migrates away from toy states and becomes really the you know, entertainment uh, object that it, it, it seems to have been pushed towards. Because wrapped up with that are a whole lot of politics, I think, about the nature of domestic space, about how we navigate through it and how we relate generally to technologies. Uh, in society. So look, that's, um, I think that was like about seven and a half minutes or something. <laughs> so uh, if anyone has any questions about anything, I'm happy to field them. Uh, we should be saying. Yeah, um, you're, uh, you seem kind of optimistic that these things develop like symbiotically. 